nanohub.org. Okay, so <clears throat> I guess in the last lecture, I we discussed things in terms of this density of states and this mode density that I mentioned without really getting into the issues of what determines the density of states. So, you know, if you know it, then from once you have the density of states, this is how you would calculate conductance. And just one point I think some of you asked me during the break that I thought I would mention is, you know, this discussion did not involve any quantum mechanics really. It was like density of states times velocity. And then where did the H suddenly come from? And the point I wanted to make is the way I was trying to do this in my lecture was that classically this dV times 2L could have been anything. I mean it, it does, it could have any value. And what I tried to motivate this mode idea by saying that let us evaluate this for a one dimensional conductor using this standard way to you take E k relationships and impose bound the periodic boundary conditions and all that which I think brings in the quantum mechanics. But when you do that then for an ordinary 1 D conductor this quantity comes out as 1 over H. And so you say well a 1 D conductor it makes sense to call it the number of modes. It is like 1 D is like one mode and that is one, 1 over H. And any complicated conductor you could mentally think of as lots of conductors in parallel. So in general then what you have would be 1 over H times the number of modes, number of how many conductors in parallel. Okay? But the way the H came was simply by evaluating this for a 1D conductor, that is it. Anyway, so what I want to talk about then for the next hour or so, next 45 minutes to an hour is the E k relation for graphene and where that comes from and specifically I think what Mark had asked me to do was also introduce this, uh, this Dirac equation that is when you look at the literature a lot of the discussion of graphene usually starts from the Dirac equation and in this context where that comes from and how you relate it to this band structure etc. So, on the one hand I want to talk about a few things that are like probably many of you may be familiar. It is in my book like chapters 5 and 6 is the graphene band structure and those of you who have taken my courses or it is on the nano hub there are more detailed discussions. On the other hand if I leave all that out and get straight into Dirac equation I am afraid I will lose many of you because many of you may not even if you have seen it may not remember it right what we are talking. So what I will try to do is describe some of these principles of band structure and all which are probably familiar to you and then connect up to the Dirac equation. But I will go through it relatively fast so that if you have not seen it before it will not necessarily you know uh, be self contained. So, you know I will draw on this. Okay. Now the basic thing about band structure then <coughs> in the context of what we are doing here. I would say is your starting point you think should be this Schrodinger equation. And that would usually look something like E psi equals some differential operator psi. Now usually this differential equation is a very convenient thing to use when you are especially for analytical calculations almost all numerical calculations usually would turn it into an equivalent matrix equation first thing and then it would use the solve the matrix version of it. That is what you can do is you can use a set of basis functions and you say that the function that I am trying to find the psi is a superposition of many of these basis functions. So these are all known functions. And the expansion here has this coefficient psi m. So these are all the, these are all numbers, these are not functions. So this is the function I am trying to find and I write it as a linear combination of some known set of basis functions. 
and these coefficients then are found by solving a matrix equation which looks something like this then E psi m is equal to psi n So, that is a differential equation which you can convert to a matrix equation like this. This is of course, something you could visualize as a matrix is E times some column vector psi is equal to the matrix H times psi. And how do you write the elements of this matrix? Well, there is the ab initio methods where you actually start straight from Schrodinger equation or there are semi empirical methods where you fit it to your favorite experiments and see if you can use those parameters to predict other things and compare with experiment. Right? Okay. So, <clears throat> now in the context of graphene for example or any semiconductor people have studied all this and they have a pretty good idea what all these H's to use. And the method uh, I will assume we will be using here is this generally what is called the tight binding method where what these basis functions are is these basis functions are what you might call the atomic functions that is graphene as you know is composed of carbon atoms arranged in a hexagonal lattice like this and the basis functions you are using are atomic wave functions around each carbon atom. So, typically I guess for carbon as you know the atomic number is 6. So, it is 1 s 2, 2 s 2 and then this 2 is a, so in the 2s and 2p levels you have 4 electrons overall. And usually you ignore the core electrons and you use this 2s and 2p as your basis functions. So, if you did that then you would have a total number of basis functions would be <coughs> like 4 per carbon atom. So, when you write this equation here, this matrix equation, the size of this matrix would have been like 4 n by 4 n, where n is the number of carbon atoms, okay. That is what you would end up with and then you could try to solve this. Now, there is a very important principle of band structure which helps solving equations like this and that is that if you have a periodic solid then actually you can write down the solutions of this almost by inspection. You do not actually have to go to your computer okay? and that is the principle that I will just briefly review. As I said there are lectures on the nano hub about all this that you could look up later if you have not seen this. Okay. Now, the basic idea is this <coughs> that the way this is written these n's and m's would be running over every basis function you know all 4 n of them. But it is more convenient to think of it something like this E psi n. Now, let me explain what I mean by this. So, <clears throat> instead of thinking of it like this where each of these n's runs over all the basis functions. What is more convenient is to think of it as if these indices run only over unit cells, one unit cell after another. Now, what do I mean by a unit cell? The idea is that if you take this thing. What you, what you mean by unit cell is the basic periodic unit, the, the one unit that you could replicate over and over and create the entire solid. Now, the point is that if you, your, your inclination may be to take one carbon atom as your unit cell, okay. I could say well you know I have got this carbon and I replicate it, but that would not quite do. Why? Because this carbon looks different from that carbon. Here it has got two things on this side, one on that side, here it is one on this side, two things on that side. So, one carbon atom is not a good unit cell, would not work. You need to consider 
two of them together. But once you consider two of them together, then it makes a nice unit cell in the sense you stand here, look around you, whatever it looks like, you go someplace else, look around you, it will look exactly the same. There will always be you know, two things on, on the left, two things on the right. It will look exactly the same no matter where you go. And so the idea is then that you should think of, you are writing this entire cell matrix equation as something like this, where this summation is over all the unit cells. But within a unit cell, when I write the wave function here, when I write that, it is not just one number like this one. In other words, it's not just the coefficient of one of them, but it is the coefficient of all the basis functions in that unit cell. So how many basis functions would I have in general? Well, in general, I got two carbon atoms, four for each one, so I'd have eight basis functions. So in general, the way you'd think about this one is that this is a eight by one element. So for every M, what you have here is an eight by one thing. Then for every N and M, this thing is an eight by eight matrix. This one is an eight by one. And this is kind of what you run into when you do band structure calculations of any semiconductor. Usually. In fact, people often use more basis functions. So instead of 8, it becomes 10. And then if you include spin, it becomes 20. And it gets quite complicated. It's not something I could do on a blackboard easily after this, you see. Now, what makes graphene very interesting and special is that because of this nice planar thing, of these 8, it decouples nicely into 2 and 6. In other words, you see the basis functions I mentioned, where this S, Px, Py, Pz. And you've got these two carbon atoms per unit cell. Each one has S, P, X, P, Y, P, Z. And so you would have eight components to it in general, the eight coefficients. And the thing is, these six are separate from that one. They kind of decouple separate, as long as it is perfectly flat. Now, if there was some curvature to it, there'd be some mixing, which people worry about. The thing is, lots of Actual research papers are written ignoring these completely. This is what you call the sigma bonds and so on. So when you look at the density of states, I guess I wipe that out. If your chemical potential is somewhere here, for current flow, what you really are interested in is the density of states around the chemical potential. And these are all described by just these PZ orbitals, whereas all these others they contribute to states deep down here and states way up there, which are very important if you're interested in mechanical properties of this, for example, because that's where a lot of the binding energy, the strength of the binding and all that comes from. But if you're talking about current flow, then all that matters is the states right around the chemical potential or the Fermi energy, because when you put a little voltage, these are the states that will carry the current. So there's lots of you know, research quality papers that are regularly published, which basically use just the two by two part of it, the, where the basis functions are really just one PZ orbital on each carbon atom. And so every unit cell basically has two of these things, one PZ orbital here, one PZ orbital there. And so the equation you'd solve would look like this. So I'll write it up here. So I'll just write this. So this is the set of matrix equations that one has to solve. And where all these indices, they just run over all the unit cells. And within each unit cell then, like if I say take one, two, and I ask what is the size of this matrix? Well, it's two by two. Two by two because there's two things here and I have to tell you how those two things are connected to two things there. So H1, if I'm looking at the H between these two unit cells, it will be a two by two, that's it. Now, as I say, the principle of band structure is the following. It goes like this that 
as long as this is a periodic solid, and these m's are all the unit cells, the solution can be written in this form. That's it. So, <clears throat> what you can show, this is the part that, uh, of course, with differential equations, you know, it's hard to motivate exactly how one sees that something will work. But if someone tells you something will work, you can always kind of substitute it in there and check if it works or not. Okay? So, here also I'd say, well, if this is the solution, put it in here and see what happens. And what you'd get is, if you take this and put it back in here, you'd get something like this. So, if I just take this, substitute it in there, then what happens is, is phi e to the power i k dot r m. So, that is what you get here phi e to the power i k dot r m. And then on this side, I had a e to the power i k dot r n, which I have taken over here and written it this way. So, the bottom line is that if I substitute this solution in here, I would get a 2 by 2 matrix equation like this. So, this is a this is a column vector with two components, that is a column vector with two components and these are all 2 by 2 matrices. And for any given k, you would have to do this summation, but after you do this summation, what you would get is a 2 by 2 matrix. Now, why is it important? for this solution that the structure be periodic. The idea is that you see this summation that we are doing here, if you look at it, you are standing at some n. So, let me draw that thing again. So, you are standing at some n and then you have to do this summation over all the neighboring m's, all the neighboring unit cells. So, you have to stand here, do the summation over this, this, this and this. And if you wrote it out, you, there will be four term, there will be five terms in the summation. Five because you put m equal to n, then you put m equal to that and then you put m equals that, so that equals that. So, you have five terms and you write it all out. And the thing is, that this solution will work if after doing that what you come out with is independent of the n that you used, independent of where I stand. In other words, if someone decides that instead of standing here and doing his summation, he is going to stand here and do his summation around that, he should get exactly the same matrix. Because if not, then of course this solution isn't really working because this thing gives you a number that is dependent on n and then I can't solve it, I can't get any further. But in a periodic structure, of course the important thing is that because no matter where you stand, the surroundings look the same. So, if you stand here and do the sum or if you stand here and do the sum, you will always get the same matrix back. And that is what this matrix is. Okay. So, that is this principle of band structure that I am kind of as I said, not really doing justice to it because normally if I were teaching this, this would be kind of the whole lecture, right. On the other hand, we want to get on to more important things. So, I am just sort of saying enough so you can see the rest, ok. So, <clears throat> the bottom line then is that when you try to find the band structure, the way it works is that you evaluate this H of k. So, the basic equation that you then solve looks something like this. E phi, phi has two components, 
and those two components denote the wave function at this carbon atom and at that carbon atom, like the A atom and the B atom, the two of them. So it gives you those two components and this is this. Here you have this what I had called H of K and that is obtained by taking H and M and doing that sum over all that. That's what you get here and then you put five. And the way it works is the way you are supposed to find the band structure is that you go through K. So this let's say a particular direction in K, choose any K, evaluate this quantity. It's a two by two matrix which has two eigenvalues and you find the two of them. Go to another K, solve it again, find the two eigenvalues and you connect, draw all these eigenvalues, different Ks. And all these when you join up it looks something like this, when you join up it looks something like this and that's how you get your two bands. That's how the thing is supposed to work. And in general semiconductors what happens is you have eight or ten components which is why band structures look very complicated. For every K there's about eight or ten branches in the whole thing. That's what normally band structures look like. In graphene again because the simplest description which seems to work very well involves just two of them, you just get two branches. And the Fermi energy or the chemical potential is right in the middle. The number of electrons is such that if there were no extra electrons from anywhere, it would exactly fill up half the states. So half the states means every and what I'll show is the states come in pairs so that any time you get one here, you get one there. So half the states basically means everything below this middle is filled, everything above is empty. So this H of K looks something like this. You have zero here, zero here, you have some complex number here and the conjugate of that complex number over there. That's this H of K. And what does this H0 look like? That's this minus T times 1 plus 2 So this is the result that I'm kind of stating without proof. This is what, as I said, normally would take one or two lectures to go through, but this is in my book and it is lectures out there that you could look at. But the bottom line then is that for any K, if you want to find the two allowed eigenvalues, this EK relationship, what you do is find all kind, find, you know, substitute your, the K you want, write down this matrix, find its eigenvalues, plot it, go to the next K, plot it, go to the next K, plot it and if you connect it all up, you'll have the EK relation. That's the basic idea okay. and that's what this expression looks like and you'll notice the nice thing about it is there's only one parameter involved in this whole thing, that's this T here. What's this T? That's like in this carbon lattice, when you write this Hamiltonian matrix, it, it, it in, tells you the degree of the ease with which electrons can go from one PZ orbital to the next. The overlap, they say overlap integral between these two PZ orbitals next to each other. And people believe it is somewhere between 2.5 and 3 electron volts. Based on all the experiments, all the work people have done in this area, I think it's about 2.5 to 3 volts. And that's the only parameter involved. You see everything else that A and B, those are just the parameters of the lattice. B is this distance well known exactly what it is, A is that distance well known exactly what it is, etc. So this is the whole thing. <clears throat> now the first point I want to make then is that if you look at the bands here, if you plot it on this scale, you know this is Kx, Ky and at every point here you could calculate two eigenvalues and those two eigenvalues will come in pairs because what you can show is when you have a matrix like this, its two eigenvalues are given by E is equal to plus and minus magnitude of H0. That you can show easily. This two by two matrix, those are its two eigenvalues. So you'll have these two eigenvalues. So 
any time, so your chemical potential is somewhere around here zero, and then there's a plus H zero, that's one eigenvalue, minus H zero, that's the other eigenvalue. That's it. Okay. So which ones are the most important ones? You'd say those regions in K space where the eigenvalues are close to zero, because that's where the chemical potential is. So for some value of K, if this happens to be three volts, it re really doesn't matter. Unless you put a huge voltage across a ballistic section, it won't matter. So what matters is those regions where this is really small. So the first thing you do is you say, well, at what values of K is this H0 close to zero? Where does it have its minimum values? And I think in the handout, I had a plot that's like a grayscale plot. What it is is, is this Kx and Ky, and what I plot there is, if it's dark, it means the eigenvalues are small. And if it is white, that means it's big. So the important regions are the dark places. See? So that I think you have in your handout. And what you'll find is the dark regions are somewhere here. And you can see why. Where do, where do these dark regions occur? Well, this is a point where Kx is zero. So if you look at this expression, supposing Kx is zero, what that means is this factor is one. So what value of Ky would make this quantity zero? Well, it's one plus two cosine. So if the cosine happens to be a minus a half, then of course it would just cancel and it gets zero. So when is cosine minus a half? Well, when the angle is 120 degrees or two pi over three. So that's these two points. The cosine two pi over three and the cosine minus two pi over three. Similarly, if you look at the points where kx is equal to pi, if you look in there, kx equals pi means e to the power i pi. That's actually a minus one. So now what I have is one minus two cosine kyb. So when will that be zero? Well, whenever the cosine happens to be plus a half, not minus a half, because I already picked up the minus from there. So now I need a plus a half. So that's like when this is pi over three. So that's where these are. It's like halfway to that point. So those are the six regions which are most important. You see? And as you know, in band structure, EK relation may have a very complicated you know, relationship over the entire kx, ky, kz in general plane. But what matters is these values. And what you try to do is try to get a simple expression for e versus kx, ky around those important points. Because you say, well, that's what will matter. So the usual thing we do when we write e equals ec plus h bar squared k squared over 2m, you could view that as kind of a Taylor series expansion around one of those minima one of those values where it happens to be. And the sim in a similar spirit, you could say, well, what I'd like to do is figure out what this EK relationship looks like, how I could write it in a compact way around those points, for example, around those values, those places. Because in general, of course, it's given by this. That's it. It's nothing more. All we're saying is, could we get an approximate relation around those points? What does it look like? Okay. Now, <clears throat> The one point I'd like to make, and this again invokes some concepts that if you have not seen it before wouldn't be clear, is this idea of a reciprocal lattice or the Brewan zone. What I mean by that is, this has to do with this number of values again. So, you know in silicon it has six values also. That you might say that, well, looks like graphene also has six values, just like silicon. You know, there are six regions in K space where you have those things. But actually, graphene really has only two values overall. And the reason is this, that if you draw the Brewan zone, it looks something like this. And you are only supposed to consider states within a Brewan zone. Now, the 1D version of this is kind of relatively easy to understand. That is, if you had an EK relationship for a 1D solid, for example, it would look, say, something like this. And you usually run from minus pi over a to plus pi over a. 
And if you actually just take that EK relation and plot it out, it would go on forever like this. But of course, when you count states, you only count everything within a Brevan zone. Why? Because the argument is that a point here is the same as a point there. If you wrote down a solution, if somebody wrote, wrote down one of these solutions with a particular k, and someone else wrote down another solution for which instead of this k he used that one, the wave functions at each of the points on your lattice would still be the same. That's what you can show, that it won't make any difference. And it's a little bit to do with, I mean, it's somewhat analogous to discrete Fourier transforms, that idea also, that any time that here, any time you have a discrete lattice, it gives you this periodicity in k space, and just as the discrete uh, periodicity in real space gives you discreteness in k space, etc. So those are things we've probably seen before. But in this case, the point, important point to note is that when you are counting states, you should only consider one Brevan zone, not those out here, because this is really equivalent to that one. But you could always choose your Brevan zone appropriately depending on your convenience. You could have, for example, counted it from here to here. That would be okay. There's no reason why you should do it symmetrically like this. You could have done it this way. As long as you cover, you know, go over one Brevan zone so that no two points inside are, correspond are connected by a reciprocal lattice vector. Okay. So in this context, what it means is, you see, the reciprocal lattice vector is kind of like this. And what you can show is that this is the Brevan zone. And when you look at these valleys, every one of these only has one third of a valley there because the other two thirds is outside. So you, what you really have is like six one third valleys, which is the equivalent of two valleys really. And the way you can count things a little more conveniently is by taking this guy, for example, and moving in up here, because this and this are connected by a reciprocal lattice vector. So what is here, you could just as well put him there. Similarly, what is here could just as well be here. So the advantage then is, instead of having three one-third valleys like this, you'd have one nice full valley sitting there. You see? So your bookkeeping and kind of all that is a whole lot easier. And lots of times when you're counting states, that's a whole lot easier to do. So you have to move that. Similarly, instead of having these three guys sitting in three places, you could have them all kind of sit right there if you wanted. But the bottom line is finally, six one-third valleys make two valleys, and those two valleys, you can move around as you see fit, you know, depending on the problem at hand. So I think next day when you look at the subbands in CNT and all, you'll see that sometimes it's a little, in terms of understanding the CNT subbands in carbon nanotubes, so sometimes convenient to think of the Brevan zone a little differently. Instead of using this one, actually moving this up here and moving that there, so on. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, so, so for this discussion then, let's consider these two values. So these are what people usually write as the k value and the k prime value, two values. And what we are saying is we are only interested in the ek relationships around those two values. <clears throat> so the way to find, to simplify this, so you have a h is equal to and this quantity then is a zero if you are right at that value. And it's also a zero if you're right at that value, and right at that point. And what you'd like is an expansion of this right around those points. And the way you can do it is, you can do a, what you might call a Taylor series expansion. That is, you could write it as something times kx plus something times ky. And the question is, how do I find these somethings? You know, what is this and what's that? And the idea is that this one should be the derivative of h with respect to kx evaluated at that value. That's the Taylor series expansion, simple. So if we do that, what I'll get is, take del h del kx, 
that is equal to minus I'm taking derivative with respect to kx. So, I pick up this i a minus i a t to e to the power i k x a cosine k y b. So, all I have done is taken der partial derivative with respect to kx assuming ky is constant, that is it. <clears throat> now, we want it around that valley. So, I can now put kx a equal to 0 and ky b equal to 2 pi over 3. And what you get then is 0 means this is 1, cosine 2 pi over 3 that is the minus a half. And so the minus a half and the 2 minus 2 that cancels, so you get i a t. So I can put this i a t here. That would be the first one. Now the second one, that is this one, I would have to find del h del k y. And that would be minus t 2 t to the power i k x a and now I have to take cosine k y, I have to take the derivative so I get sin k y b <coughs> I am taking I will put a b so cosine when I take the derivative I get minus sine right so this minus would be gone no, that is minus there, yeah. And I pick up the b. And once again, I put in kx a equal to 0, ky b equals 2 pi over 3. And so what you get is 2 pi sine 120 degrees, the square root of 3 over 2. So that is square root of 3 t b. Now what you can show is that square root of 3 times b is actually a. So if you, that is just a little bit of geometry, if you take that a and this b for a hexagonal lattice, you can show square root of 3b is really a. So basically you get an a t here. Now what if I are doing this at the other valley? I would get much the same except that you see at the other valley, the k y b would be minus 2 pi over 3, makes no difference to this one because it is a cosine. So this would still be exactly what it is, but this one then would have picked up a minus sign if I went to the other value. Okay. Okay. So the bottom line is then that h can be written as i a t k x plus a t k y, which means I could write this as a t times i k x plus k y. This is in that one valley. I am sorry, I guess I called it k. It is the k valley. And if you do the k prime valley, it is a t times i k x minus k y. So, I should put approximately equal to because this is a Taylor series expansion. So, that object then could be written this way if you want it, <clears throat> right. So this is often the basis for like you see the usual expansion that uh, usually the way you use the this effective mass equations is that you, so I can take this off now. The way you normally use effective mass equations is to say that we, E is equal to E c plus h bar square k square over 2 m. And then we turn this into a differential equation by saying E psi is equal to E c minus h bar square over 2 m del squared psi. Because the idea is that if you had started from a differential equation like this and assumed a solution like a plane wave, you would have got this dispersion relation. And the effective mass equation kind of works in backwards. 
you say that since I know EK looks like this, I'm going to replace K with minus IH bar del and get an effective mass equation like this. And then I'll use this equation for treating all kinds of slowly varying potentials. So one of the first uses of the effective mass equation in semiconductors was to impurity levels in semiconductors, where the idea is that you take this equation and then you add an impurity potential to it and try to find the impurity levels and so on. Right? That was one of the first uses back in the 60s of the effective mass equation. And in general, whenever we try to do calculate particle in a box levels in the conduction band, what we are using is an equation like that. What have you gained instead of starting from the original Schrodinger equation? Well, the original Schrodinger equation would have this enormous atomic potential in it. This one has no atomic potential in it. That's all part of the effective mass story. That's all part of that. This now almost looks like an electron in vacuum right? with a different effective mass. That's what you're normally doing. <clears throat> now, in the graphene context, of course, we don't have something like that. But what we have is something looking like this, where we could approximate H with this. So we could write this E as, so I could write, let me write it up here. So let's say I'm working with the K value. Then the equation would look something like this. You see, as I said, this band structure equation, that was this one. And what I did was expanded this around the k valley. And now it looks like that. And now instead of k, I can put in derivative. You see? So k would be like minus i d dx. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is actually the complex conjugate of this. So I should write minus i k x plus k y. Whereas if you went to the other valley, then what would have happened is instead of plus ky, I would have a minus ky. Okay? But at the k valley, this is the equation. And the thing is, I can now turn that into a differential e equation. You know, in the same spirit that people turn this into a differential equation. What do they do? Well, they just take k and replace it with, like if you have a kx, you replace it with minus i d d x. If you have a ky, replace it with minus i d d y, etc. That, and it goes both ways. If I had a differential equation, you could write a dispersion relation. If you give me a dispersion relation, I can turn it into a differential equation and go on and use it for other things. So same spirit, you could say, I can take this, replace all the k's with i d d x, and turn it into a differential equation that I use hereafter. It's a little more complicated than that one because it's got two components now. Only thing, the differential equation will now be a coupled differential equation with two components two components that you should interpret as the A component of your wave function and the B component of your wave function. So the wave functions over the unit cells are all plane waves, e to the power i k x type of thing. But within a unit cell is two components. The one that tells you the A, what's on the A side, what's on the B side. That's it. So that's how <clears throat> you could get a differential equation of this sort. And what I'll talk about for the next few minutes then as we finish up is the connection to the Dirac equation. That is, a lot of people who are, are doing calculations which start from something like this. You see? And this looks a little bit like the Dirac equation that is used in relativistic quantum mechanics. And of course, if you are familiar with the solutions to that, then the one advantage is you can take certain things and apply it here. If you're not familiar, then it probably doesn't really help a whole lot. You could as well start from here, or you could have even started from here, I suppose, in general. You could have just gone from the, without doing any expansions even. You could do just the whatever we had in the beginning, okay? <clears throat> okay, now, in order to talk about the, this Dirac equation though, I need to explain a little bit about something called the spin matrices, the poly spin matrices. <clears throat> 
and which are in your notes and it's kind of late in the day for this, but let me try to explain this anyway. Now, <clears throat> the spin, the basic idea, if you have not seen much, of, you know, not familiar with spin, I always say that the closest analogy is the polarization of light. That almost as if, just as light, if it's propagating in a certain direction, it has these two orthogonal polarizations. It can be X or Y. And you think of these two polarizations of light. Similarly with spin, you can have two components. This is very sim analogous in that sense. Now there's one important difference though. It works like this. Supposing with light, you had a polarizer. You see that lets light in in this direction. And here you have an analyzer that's in some other direction. Or let's say you let in light at some angle theta and then you have an analyzer which only lets out light in this direction. Now, <clears throat> what would get through? And the answer is, it would be given by cosine squared theta. And everyone understands why that is so, because it's this vector, it has a component of cosine theta along that and sine theta along the other direction. So the components you write as cosine theta and sine theta. And when you square that, that's what gives you the intensity. That's how you get cosine squared theta. Now spin is very similar, except that instead of being cosine theta and sine theta, it's actually cosine half theta and sine half theta. And that's, I guess, has a very direct experimental consequence that you can see man, these days. That, as you know, people have done experiments these days with devices that have magnetic contacts, you know, two magnets. So one magnet injects a spin in a certain direction that depends on what direction the magnet is in. And the other one acts as an analyzer, which looks at what, which allows some component to come out, right? That's a, now with light, if one polarizer was in this direction and you wanted to block it, you'd make the other polar analyzer in this direction, 90 degrees. With spin, if one magnet is in this direction and you want to block it, you make the other magnet in the anti-parallel direction. So if it's one is this way, the other is what, 180 degrees. You see, with light, if you had put a polarizer and an analyzer that was anti-parallel, it wouldn't have blocked the light. It would have let just as much to go through. But with, so the point is that with light, what is like 90 degrees, with spin is like 180 degrees. You have to put here 180 degrees in order to get the same effect as 90 degrees. See, that's the point. And <clears throat> so in thinking about spin, the important point here is that just as we learn about vectors, which we, usually the components of a vector, the way you write it is cosine theta along z. If you had a, like a unit vector pointing in some direction theta and phi, you write the z component as cosine theta and the x and y components as sine theta. Cosine phi and sine theta sine phi. Now, so this is how you would write the components of a vector. That's something we learned somewhere in first year college, I guess. Now, if you are trying to write the components of a spinner, that is the spin, it has got two components, an up component and a down component. And the up component is given by cosine half theta e to the power minus i phi over 2 and sine half theta e to the power plus i phi over 2. <clears throat> so when writing the components of a vector, you have these three real components. When writing the components of a spinner, of course mentally we are still, still thinking of something that points in some direction. But when you write its components, instead of writing three real things, we write two complex things. And that's what kind of goes into Schrodinger equation, that's how you represent it and so on, right? Now, this of course, again, if you haven't seen this before, the, you know, it takes some time to, disc, to sink in. And again, on the nano hub, I think I have a couple of lectures on this, just this concept of spins and all that you can look up. But here I just wanted to say enough so that you can see the connection to the Dirac equation and how it goes, you know, how the Dirac equation works. Now, 
The next point I wanted to make, and that has to do with this poly spin matrices. And that is that the poly spin matrices, there are three of them. Sigma x, which is 0, 1, 1, 0. Sigma y, which is 0, minus i, plus i, and 0. And sigma z, which is 1, 0, 0, minus 1. Okay. Now, you might ask that, well, how do I write these components here that I wrote down? You know, I said that, so where does this come from? And that, of course, by you know, proper discussion takes a lot more time. But the point I wanted to make is that this, in a way, is like the eigenvectors of these matrices. So what I mean by that is, let's look at, say, the components of this for a spin that points along x. So let's say this is the z direction, and you have a spin that points along x, and that angle, let us say, is you say would be 90 degrees. So if you put that in, phi is 0, so it will be cosine pi over 4 sine pi over 4. So this would be like 1, 1 with a 1 over root 2 for normalizing. So if you have a spin that points along x, then its components are given by 1, 1. Now that also is an eigenvector of this matrix. So another way of finding the spin along x is to find the eigenvectors of this. Similarly, if you want the spin along y, you find the eigenvectors of this. If you want the spin along this, you find the eigenvectors of this. And one of the things you'll see in the literature in this context a lot is this quantity, sigma dot n. Now, what does that mean? This n is a unit vector in some direction, you know, which has these components. So what you're supposed to do is take sigma x and take the x component of n, which is sine theta cosine phi, then take sigma y sine theta sine phi, and then take sigma z and cosine theta. So sigma dot n is like sigma x times the x component of n, sigma y times the y component of n, sigma z times the z component of n. That's what I did. Took those things, wrote it down. And each one of these is a 2 by 2 matrix. So if you add all that up, you'll get a nice 2 by 2 matrix. And whose eigenvector will actually be that? That's the point. So if you want an eigenvector, if you want to know how to represent the spin in a particular direction, it's like you take sigma dot n, find its eigenvectors. And one eigenvector is the up along that direction, the other eigenvector would be the down along that direction. That's how it works generally. And so this is a quantity that you see often. Now this is very useful once you get used to this idea because what it does is it allows you to represent <coughs> these quantities that have two complex components as a vector. Visualize any quantity with two complex components as some kind of a vector pointing in some direction. And it works both ways. Vectors can be represented as two complex components or the other. It's a, there's a mapping, clear mapping. And this often allows you to visualize these objects. You know, this is this pair of complex quantities. Ordinarily, you couldn't visualize it. But using this mapping, once you get used to it, and it takes some time, of course, you can visualize them. And that's this concept generally you see, you often hear the word pseudo-spin. Like, now, what, does you, what do you mean by pseudo-spin? It often has nothing to do with spin. It means that in a given physical problem, for some reason, your wave function has two complex components. And as long as that two complex components, I could mentally use this mapping to think of it as a vector pointing in some direction. So that would be the pseudo spin direction, sort of, that mapping, you see? And that's again a visualization aid, I'd say. If you don't want to use it, you can keep using this. There's no reason why not, okay? Now, the two important properties I wanted to mention here. One is the sigma dot n, that it's eigenvectors give me the, give me the components pointing in that direction along n. And the other property is that if you take sigma dot n and square it, you get the identity matrix. If you take that matrix, multiply it by itself, you'll get i. And these are again in the notes I handed out. So you can easily check this for yourself. I've got, I think I wrote down that matrix, 
and I also mentioned that the square is i. Now this is something I'll be using for discussing this Dirac equation. <coughs> Okay, now the Dirac equation, the way it works is the following. You see, the Schrodinger equation worked something like this. The people said that we know that E is equal to P squared over 2M. That was the classical energy momentum relationship. And how do you get a Schrodinger equation out of it? Well, instead of E, you put IH bar D dt. And instead of P, you put minus IH bar del. And so that's how you get this. So that's how usually you say heuristically, anytime you have a EK relation or EP relation, energy momentum relation, you can write the corresponding wave equation. And once this was understood, I guess back around like 1930 or so, Dirac was then trying to figure out what to write for the relativistic energy momentum relation. And the relativistic energy momentum relation works something like this looks something like this. <clears throat> so relativistically, energy and momentum are related this way. So if you have zero momentum, E is equal to mc square, the most famous equation in science, yes? And when you plot this, E versus momentum, momentum, it will look something like this, E versus P, and this is mc square. And if you do a binomial expansion around that, then you can show that this will be something like mc square plus p square over 2m. So people say that the non-relativistic version is sort of like a binomial expansion around that. Anyway, but the point here is then, given this, how do I write down a, write down a differential equation to go with it, given that I know E becomes IH bar D dt and P becomes a minus IH bar del. The whole problem, of course, is I've got a square root here. You see, because if I write E, that's like a square root. Now, how exactly do I write the square root of a di differential operator? And this is where Dirac came up with this brilliant idea. He saw that. He said that, you see, I can't write a what I can write is a matrix like this. So this is actually a four by four matrix, where this I is a two by two identity matrix, and sigma dot P, you know, I just explained, these are all two by two matrices. That's this, this, and this, this minus mc squared i. So overall, there's a four by four matrix. And the point is the property of this matrix is if you square it, that is if I multiply it by itself, what I'll get is exactly this times the four by four identity matrix. In other words, if I multiply this by itself, then the final result will be, if I multiply those two things, final result will be an identity matrix with that thing in front. So in a sense, he had managed to take the square root of this, you see? because E is equal to square root of this. And so the final Dirac equation is IH bar D psi DT is equal to this times psi. So, and this is almost like the square root of that operator because as I said, you know, if you multiply these two things and that's easy to show actually, we can check. You know, you can see that all the diagonal stuff will be zero. How? Because, you know, when I multiply these two things, supposing I multiply this by this and this way by this, you can see mc square sigma dot p, sigma dot p minus mc square just cancels out. When you look at the diagonal elements, you got mc square times mc square, that's m square c4, and then you got sigma dot p whole square. And that, of course, because of this property would give you just p square. 
etc. So you can do this algebra, but the important point is you can show that this is almost like the square root of that operator. And so the Dirac equation looks something like this. <clears throat> Ih bar d dt of psi. And now his psi actually has four components. So is equal to this four by four differential operator times psi. So that's the standard four component Dirac equation usually. You had to, thank you, thank you, very good, yeah, yeah, thank you. There should be a C here, very good. Okay. So this is a two by two matrix, that's a two by two, that's a two by two, that's a two by two, okay. Now if you apply this to something that's moving in two dimensions, so the momentum only has X and Y components and no Z component, then you see that equation becomes something like this. I h bar d d t of this four component guy, one, two, three, four, is equal to m c square, m c square, zero, zero, and then this c sigma dot p, we are saying p only has x component and y component. So this is c sigma x p x plus c sigma y p y. And I think if you write that out, it would look like 0 C P X minus I P Y C P X plus I P Y 0. And then here you'll have minus M C square minus M C square and then C px minus ipy and this is in your notes actually i've written this out so you can look at that now if you actually had the particle also moving in the z direction that would have complicated it because then you'd have picked up pz components here right but because we are in this plane in the xy plane you leave out the pz components so those are out those are out and then you see this four by four kind of neatly decouples into a two by one, two by two, that's this, and the other one, that's this, you see, because all the other stuff is zero. So you could, I can just rearrange rows and columns and kind of write it as two separate two by twos. And any one of them, I guess, you'll notice looks a lot like that. That's the point I'm making, that you see this AT, that's of course h bar times the velocity in graphene because d e d k that's really that guy. So this is h bar v and you see that looks a lot like this with the masses equal to zero because these two are zero. So with the mass terms equal to zero, so you would say it's a massless Dirac fermion will be the massless Dirac equation. So that's the equation we are talking about. Now one thing you'll notice is that it's not quite the same the way we have done it. Namely, <clears throat> you see I had here i k x plus k y, whereas what appears here, depending on which one you look at, it looks like p x plus i p y. Looks a little different, you see. And this is where the choice of coordinate system determines exactly what you'll get, see? So you see in a lot of papers where they initially start with a coordinate system like I have drawn, with the x going this way and the y going that way. And, but then when they actually connect up to the Dirac equation, they rotate the coordinates because otherwise it doesn't quite come out right, you see? You rotate the coordinates accordingly. And so usually the rotated coordinates, the ones they will use would be something like this. <clears throat> So if instead of using my x and y like this, I put my, I just turn it 90 degrees. 
So this is x prime and this is y prime. Hmm, I've just turned it 90 degree. Then I think what will happen is that equation will become like 0 h bar v f times you see what was x is kind of now like minus y. So I would write here i k y prime remind myself I have rotated coordinates and what was y is now x. Similarly here of course I just get the complex conjugate. So now you see it starts looking like kx plus iky and kx minus iky looks like that one for example. Now if you want it to look like this where, where you have the kx minus iky up here and the kx plus iky down here then what you have to do is interchange the a and b. So whatever you call the a component you should start calling it the b so interchange them. So but the thing is that once you have adjusted all that then you would have a Dirac, equa a Dirac like equation which you could write as as if this can be written as you know c sigma dot p c sigma dot p or c h h bar c sigma dot k. So you could write the interaction and write the Hamiltonian kind of compactly like that you see and that is what a lot of the literature does. There is a lot of literature because it was the work was done by physicists who are already familiar with the Dirac equation. So that is where they start almost that is what they use in this context and so when you decide on things like when you try to do problems like particle in a box levels and things like that just as in an ordinary semiconductor you take the effective mass equation and do things you would usually start from the Dirac equation and do things. But it is not really necessary I mean even if you have not heard of Dirac equation do not know any of this you could just have done it with the tight binding model that we started from is really not necessary. On the other hand if you want to follow the literature and connect with them then it is really important to be able to translate and connect up accordingly. And the one important concept though that is useful kind of way beyond graphene and anything else is that whole idea of pseudo spin that which I did not really do justice to it I kind of skimmed over it that whole idea that a two component complex thing can be visualized as a vector and reverse and I have seen that work you know people who do like optical polarization in say fibers. I have seen them represent even optical polarization as a two component complex thing. So use this thing in reverse I have seen them do that and the reverse that whenever you have a two component wave function with complex components you can visualize it as a vector and that way you have a pictorial way of thinking. So you in graphene you have an electron going from one state to another you know that goes from say conduction band to valence band and the wave function changes somewhat. So it goes from one complex two component thing to another complex two component thing and mentally it is useful if you can think of it as, as if there was some pseudo spin like this that went in like that. You see that then you have a nice picture pictorial way of thinking about it. So that is a co concept that is useful in graph graphene and in many other contexts really it is a much more general thing okay. Thank you. <clears throat> And that would usually look something like E psi equals some differential operator psi. Now usually this differential equation is a very convenient thing to use when you are especially for analytical calculations. Almost all numerical calculations usually would turn it into an equivalent matrix equation first thing and then it would use the solve the matrix version <coughs> of it. That is what you can do is you can use a set of basis functions and you say that the function that I am trying to find the psi is a superposition of many of these basis functions. So these are all known functions and the expansion here has this coefficient psi m. So these are all the these are all numbers these are not functions. So this is the function I am trying to find and I write it as a linear combination of some known set of basis functions. And these coefficients then are found by solving a matrix equation which looks something like this then. 
E psi m is equal to psi n So that's a differential equation which you can convert to a matrix equation like this. This is of course something you could visualize as a matrix is E times some column vector psi is equal to the matrix H times psi. And how do you write the elements of this matrix? Well, Okay, so, <clears throat> I guess in the last lecture, I, we discussed things in terms of this density of states and this mode density that I mentioned without really getting into the issues of what determines the density of states. So, I mean, if you know it, then from once you have the density of states, this is how you would calculate conductance. And just one point I think some of you asked me during the break that I thought I would mention is, you know, this discussion did not involve any quantum mechanics really. It was like density of states times velocity. And then where did the H suddenly come from? And the point I wanted to make is the way I was trying to do this in my lecture was that classically this dV times 2L could have been anything. I mean, it, it, does, it could have any value. And what I tried to motivate this mode idea by saying that let us evaluate this for a one dimensional conductor using this standard way to you take E k relationships and impose bound the periodic boundary conditions and all that which I think brings in the quantum mechanics. But when you do that then for an ordinary 1 D conductor this quantity comes out as 1 over H. And so you say, well, a 1D conductor, it makes sense to call it the number of modes. It's like 1D is like one mode and that's one, 1 over H. And any complicated conductor, you could mentally think of as lots of conductors in parallel. So in general, then what you have would be 1 over H times the number of modes, number of how many conductors in parallel. Okay? But the way the H came was simply by evaluating this for a 1D conductor. That's it. Anyway, so what I want to talk about then for the next hour or so, next 45 minutes to an hour is the E k relation for graphene and where that comes from and specifically I think what Mark had asked me to do was also introduce this, uh, this Dirac equation that is when you look at the literature, a lot of the discussion of graphene usually starts from the Dirac equation. And in this context, where that comes from and how you relate it to this band structure, etc. So, on the one hand, I want to talk about a few things that are like probably many of you may be familiar. It's in my book, like chapters five and six, is the graphene band structure. And those of you who have taken my courses or it's on the Nano Hub, there are more detailed discussions. On the other hand, if I leave all that out and get straight into Dirac equation, I'm afraid I'll lose many of you because many of you may not, even if you have seen it, may not remember it, okay, what we are talking. So what I'll try to do is describe some of these principles of band structure and all, which are probably familiar to you, and then connect up to the Dirac equation. But I will go through it relatively fast so that if you haven't seen it before, it won't necessarily, you know, uh, be self-contained. So, you know, I'll draw on this. Okay. Now, the basic thing about band structure then, <clears throat> in the context of what you're doing here, I'd say is your starting point you think should be this Schrodinger equation. Band structure which helps solving equations like this. And that is that if you have a periodic solid, then actually you can write down the solutions of this almost by inspection. You don't actually have to go to your computer. Right? And that's the principle that I'll just briefly review. As I said, there are lectures on the Nano Hub about all this that you could look up later if you haven't seen this. Okay. Now the basic idea is this, <clears throat> that 
the way this is written, these n's and m's would be running over every basis function, you know, all four n of them. But it's more convenient to think of it something like this, E psi n. Now let me explain what I mean by this. So, <clears throat> instead of thinking of it like this, where each of these n's runs over all the basis functions, what is more convenient is to think of it as if these indices run only over unit cells, one unit cell after another. Now, what do I mean by a unit cell? The idea is that if you take this thing, what you, what you mean by unit cell is the basic periodic unit, the, the one unit that you could replicate over and over and create the entire solid. Now the point is that if you, you know, your inclination may be to take one carbon atom, well, there's the ab initio methods where you actually start straight from Schrodinger equation or there are semi empirical methods where you fit it to your favorite experiments and see if you can use those parameters to predict other things and compare with experiment. Right? Okay. So <clears throat> now in the context of graphene, for example, or any semiconductor, people have studied all this and they have a pretty good idea what all these H's to use. And the method uh, I'll assume we'll be using here is this generally what's called the tight binding method, where what these basis functions are is, these basis functions are what you might call the atomic functions. That is, graphene as you know is composed of carbon atoms arranged in a hexagonal lattice like this. And the basis functions you are using are atomic wave functions around each carbon atom. So typically, I guess for carbon, as you know, the atomic number is six. So it's one S2, two S2 and then there's two, so in the 2s and 2p levels, you have four electrons overall. And usually you ignore the core electrons and you use this 2s and 2p as your basis functions. So if you did that, then you'd have a total number of basis functions would be like four per carbon atom. So when you write this equation here, this matrix equation, the size of this matrix would have been like 4n by 4n, where n is the number of carbon atoms. Okay? That's what you'd end up with. And then you could try to solve this. Now, there is a very important principle of